thank you very much for coming to this session. It's lovely to see you, and I hope it will be helpful and informative, and we want to make this a very interactive session. So as we go through, don't hesitate to say anything or ask any questions or make any comments. Um, I want to start off by doing two things. First off, um, I'd like to uh, recognise the Indigenous people on whose lands we meet, meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It's a very important part of the ANU commitment to uh, Indigenous Australians. Secondly, we're actually recording this event today and we'll put the slides and the recordings online. Feel free to say anything and if, en if anyone says something and they don't want it to be in the recording, we can take it out. So ask any questions you like, make any comments you like, but it is being recorded, but we will edit it into useful chunks. And if at any stage you would like, uh, you think you'd like anything not to be in the uh, audio that we communicate to the wider world, you can email me, Roxanne Missingham, or Imogen Ingram, and um, we'll be very happy to edit that. I should just give a bit of context to say that the library's um, running a, a project this year to put online using new technology that Imogen is managing, um, as many structured information resources as we can to help particularly um, higher degree by research students and early career academics publish successfully um, and we'll be bringing in speakers from around the world uh, and we'll be having Stephen Leader, I wish I could remember what time he's speaking, but he's speaking later this month, who used to be the editor of the Australian Medical Journal until Elsevier took it over last year and sacked him. And he's a very, very eminent uh, medical researcher who's, I think, on six or seven other editorial boards, and he'll be talking about peer review and from the perspective on a, of an editor and a peer reviewer about journal article submission and how to have a great experience with that part of the process. So we're bringing together all sorts of threads um, to help people publish successfully. And if you've got any suggestions, we'd be delighted to hear from you. But you'll be seeing publicity about um, this first module, which is really about publishing. Um, at the end of this month, we'll have the first module out. So part of publishing is dealing with and, and doing your thesis is dealing with the issue of cop copyright. So I went this morning and looked for, for some, or it was yesterday, uh, some images that I could use freely, and I really quite like this image. So are any of you Star Trek followers? <laughs> Up to a point. So these were tribbles who, that started off as one very cute little tribble that multiplied and multiplied and took over the ship. And the reason I wanted to use the image is that copyright sometimes is a bit like a triple. You start off with what you think is quite a straightforward issue. And by the time you've done some investigation and asked people for issues about issues, it can be um, full of things that are not necessarily cute and fluffy, but may be very complex. And I should start off by saying that I'm the Australian National University's Copyright Office Officer, and we put, I put a lot of stuff online to try and help you. And um, if you have inquiries that are beyond what your local school or college can support you with, you can email me and I will try and help you. And the legal office um, will also try and help. There are some things we can't help with, but we try to be as helpful as possible because it is a complex and potentially a changing issue. So, just to start off, you probably all know what copyright is. So copyright protects what is it actually written. It doesn't protect an idea. So it protects the expression of a creative skill or an idea, that is the expression of it. The idea it's not, itself is not protected, um, but what is actually written or drawn or photographed um, or coded in terms of computer software is protected by copyright. We have a Copyright Act in Australia and there is a Copyright Tribunal and there are a range of decisions that go to the courts, some of which are quite obscure and some of which are not. 
Excuse um, me, can I just ask, does it yep. also cover um, verbal expression or only written expression? It has, if you're... So if you're in a conference setting, for example. Yep. If you give a paper and it's in the PowerPoints, so it's documented, then absolutely that is covered by the Copyright Act. If, if it's, it's something not in the PowerPoint but you've submitted it in the paper... To if it's submitted in the paper, yes, it's covered. If it's something that you say and it's recorded, then it's very clear to, to, clearly covered. The difficulty comes in if you've said something and you thought you said something and other people think you said something else. So it's the documentation or the expression of it that's important. There's a chair up the front. Only one. I'm sorry to say. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> good on you, Imogen. So the other thing I wanted to say in terms of introduction is it is the expression, and you will see in books that the copyright symbol is often used with the author's name and the date or whoever owns the copyright. You do not have to put the C in the circle and the name and the date in order to protect copyright. Copyright in Australia exists in anything that is put into an expressive form. Um, it, it doesn't, it's protected in other countries by a convention that Australia has signed, the Boone Convention, and it doesn't have to be registered in the US. If you publish a book, it has to be registered with the Copyright Office, which sits in the Library of Congress. It doesn't have to be registered in Australia. Um, once you have written the expression, produced the expression, whether it's a creative form or not, copyright then exists in it, and it's regardless of whether you use the C symbol or not, regardless of whether you... Um, publish it online or publish it in print, it exists. I imagine that um, it's mainly, mainly Western countries that are signatories. What about Africa and the Middle East? So nearly every... I think there are 143 signatories to the Boone Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, but, and certainly I can look that up. China is a signatory. The case um, of um, KVM Ah. Because of the free trade agreements and other um, relationships, treaties between countries, um, many countries that may have had, um, you might have thought, a lax um, approach to copyright in the past, um, and I think particularly we would all think of Asian countries and copying of DVDs and other things, um, now have a very strong commitment to copyright and protection of intellectual property. Um, including China, and a lot of them see that as part of, um, if you like, ensuring their national success in research and education. And uh, to my mind, there's been a very strong, stronger emergence of protection of copyright and um, uh, non-acceptance of violations of copyright in the last decade. It's very strong through many countries. Can you mention India? Uh, yes. I'm assuming India would be a, a burn. Con it's not part of the no, burn convention. Generic medications are not protected by Indian um, legislation. That's a classic example. So I think they, they have factories and industries that produce generics. They're not. They're not protected. Right. It's yeah. That's not copyright. Oh, that, that is Pharmaceuticals, right. medicines are not. Copyright, that's, that's a right. different part of intellectual property. But I will actually look that up at the end of the session because I think it's probably worthwhile confirming that. Uh, you find that most of the British, for, or formerly British, or British-influenced nations have very similar copyright legislation. And there is a poor man that's actually done a study of all of the copyright legislation and exemptions and publishes books about that, and he was in Australia... Um, the month before last, and he was actually a very entertaining speaker, honestly. <laughs> um, so, just to set the framework, the Australian mm. Copyright Act, I talked about the British-based copyright legislation. So, in terms of the analysis that people do, the, the sort of critical issue of difference is fair dealing and fair use. So, in the US... It is a fair use situation. So a lot of the um, copying, um, use, oops, use of um, copyright material for education and research is done under the fair use provisions, um, which means that 
uh, an exchange of fund isn't, funding isn't required, there's much more um, digitisation of works that are in copyright. Uh, in Australia, it's a fair dealing regime. Now, this is an exception-based regime, which means there are dozens and dozens of exceptions in the Copyright Act, and we have to argue under exceptions for use of material in a lot of different cases, rather than having a fair use, which is still has tests which have gone before the courts, but you will find that the use of material in Australia, in the UK, in other places with this British-based fair dealing regime is different to a fair use regime. Albeit that Ireland has adopted a fair use regime, and lots of us argue the fair use regime is better and more uh, offers a more balanced approach for users and owners of copyright. So I'm just going to run this little video. Remember, this is a US-based one. Come on, open up. That's quite entertaining. I'm going to work. So this is a parody um, that is based on a series of excerpts from Disney movies. It's taking a little while to render. Um, you haven't got the NBN. <laughs> no, we don't have the NBN. Disney is one of the biggest protectors of copyright. leave it at that. Um, clearly it's got a much more of a commercial um, tone, um, but one of the reasons I wanted to play it at the beginning as well is because you in your career will be signing over or be asked to sign over your copyright to publishers at various times. Um, and one of the things that this video does is emphasises the importance of protecting your rights because you are the creator and you're the one that can assign rights or can assign permissions. And my, just my first tip before I get to the tip section as well is if you do sign a contract for a publication of a journal article or a conference paper, um, most people tell me that if they strike out a clause that they believe is unreasonable, many publishers will not object and will just accept your journal article or conference paper anyway. So keep the power in your hands. 
but it's quite an entertaining presentation. So I've got some little sections separately prepared because there are some different issues in relation to copyright for your thesis, your journal article, your conference paper or material used in lectures and teaching. Which would you like me to start with? Should I start with thesis? <coughs> yes. Okay. Good, because this is actually quite complex and I'm not sure that when you start your thesis you get a lot of advice around this topic because it's slightly boring but it's very important. So, in your thesis you are very likely to include material um, for which the copyright does not belong to you. So you'll be using quotes, you might use tables, you might use maps, you might use graphs. There will be other, other material that you have built your theories on or built your models on or built your analysis on that you'll be wanting to quote. Now, the submission that you do of your thesis when it is complete um, includes a box that you will tick that will say that you have cleared all material that is third-party material. And what we mean by third-party material is material which has been written, expressed, um, or uh, tabulated or graphed or mapped, for example, by someone else. So the requirement is for you to seek permission to use the material. And it, whether you, your thesis is print or online, this applies to that. It needs to be substantial material. So if you're just quoting a sentence or two, you don't necessarily need to ask for copyright unless it is absolutely a central um, point or idea. But it is vital that copyright material, material which is in copyright, which you use in your thesis, you have permission to use in your thesis. So just a reminder, a thesis in itself in Australia is an unpublished work. If you're doing your thesis in Sweden, in Germany, in Switzerland, there is a requirement for you to publish your thesis and there's a couple of companies that only basically publish theses. But in Australia um, and in the US and the UK, uh, thesis is generally an unpublished work. The first Australian book that, was, uh, that I'm aware of that was submitted um, as a thesis was um, Damned Whores and God's Police by Anne Summers, and that was actually quite controversial because that was a book submitted for a thesis. The only exception to a thesis being an unpublished work these days, really, is if you are doing a thesis by publication. Are any of you doing a thesis by publication? Yep. I'll talk a bit more about that in conference papers, <coughs> journal articles and things like that. So the principle of still getting third-party permission is important, but you're doing it in a different context because you're also signing a publisher agreement for um, the parts that you are publishing as part of your, publish your thesis by publication. Excuse me. Yep. Just clarify, how substantial is a quote to incur copyright protection in a thesis? So, if you wish to use a quote and it's substantial, um, I have seen some publishers who say... Um, Substantial is more than 200 words. Right. That's, I don't know that, it, you might say if someone else has written a journal article or a book and their seminal statement is 200 words and you use it, that might be considered to be substantial. But generally speaking, if you're just, just quoting a couple of sentences, that would not be substantial. If your thesis is about a particular book or a particular author for which the material is in copyright, not out of copyright, then if you... Because you're doing it for the purpose of research and you're doing that deep analysis, the copyright exception will apply to you because you are studying that one individual. And there is a research, a set of research and study exceptions. And if you want to ask me for some examples or if you want to come to me and ask me about some examples, I can look at that for you. And there's an exception for parroting and there's all sorts of exceptions. There are exceptions for reporting news, um, but substantial is quite a handy thing. 
Um, there is a very... So, go on. I've still got a question about that. Um, from a scientific perspective, um, my, mine is not a PhD by publication, but nevertheless, for my PhD, I'm doing quite a bit of background research, which has been published, which I will cite from yep. in my PhD. So I'm assuming that gets treated just the same as any other material for copyright. There are not substantial portions of it, but certainly yep. frequently. So if you're citing yourself and your analysis, that's, you own the copyright so you can reuse that material. If you're citing primary documents, that won't, generally speaking, require permission if it's a primary document. But if you're citing someone else's work in a, in a publication and in your article, um, if it is substantial, it will, will require permission. If it's, if it's in copyright. Yeah. Would a figure that encapsulates an idea... Um, and you acknowledged where the origin and everything. Do you still need to seek further approval to use that figure? It is so like a diagram. Yep, like a diagram. Yep. Or if it's a map and you're reworking and adapting it, mm -hmm. um, it is often and it's a it's a really important map or table or diagram for the purposes of your thesis, and it's very significant in terms of where it comes from. Seeking permission is important. That doesn't mean that you actually have to get permission if the person you are unable to contact or find the copyright owner. Mm -hmm. And I'll actually come to a whole lot of exceptions and templates about how to do it. So there is a very, very long guide that I've written. And I put in the link and not the detail, OK? It's there, but feel free to phone or ask me. But this is the short summary of the easy-to-use stuff. If you're the copyright holder, you don't have to write yourself a letter and get permission. That's OK. If the university is the copyright holder, and um, uh, it could be that um, the material you're using uh, publish reports from the university, um, that it could be that there are lecture notes and the university, under its IP policy, retains the right to use it, but the... The, the lecturer has, has the intellectual property, but we still retain rights to use it, and you would have a right to use it as a student. Um, the university may have a licence for use. Lots of the journal articles that we subscribe to from the library, we get a licence from the publisher to use it for educational research purposes, which includes any publications that you may produce and theses that you produce. So if you're getting something that's in the library um, subscribed to journal, you will find that nearly all your use is covered for so you don't have to write letters. We aim to bring you that service to help you. Um, if you have any doubts or if you just want to double check, you can talk to the staff in your local library and they can double check the licence for you. But nearly everything that we acquire, we acquire with the full rights for you to use which saves you a lot of work and we hope that helps. <coughs> Copyright may have expired, so if you're using, let's say, a film or photographs before... Now, I'm going to say you have, going to have to look at the table here, but before the 1960s, then all of that is now out of copyright. Um, the, um, the, the copyright period for normal textual works written by a single author changed with the introduction of the free US Free Trade Agreement and it's now 75 years after the death of the author. Before that, it was 50 years after the death of the author. At the moment, if you are using letters, manuscript materials, unpublished written material under the Australian legislation, that never comes out of copyright but an amendment has been proposed to the Copyright Act that would normalise that and bring that to 50 years after the death of the author. We all hope that will go through the Parliament this year because that would make it much easier to use. If it's a more modern work, it may have been published under a Creative Commons licence. Um, it could be a reproduction that, deals with, that falls in with the fair dealing or other exceptions. You may be able to reproduce with permission of the creator or um, copyright owner or you may be publishing an insubstantial portion of the work. And this is probably going to affect many of the things that you want to use. But use this as much as, much as you can. 
uh, that is having a licence for use and um, the insubstantial work will, will apply to quite a lot. So, and I've put this car up because I searched thesis and I think everyone who graduates with a thesis should get a fancy car. <laughs> and it's a very nice looking Lancia. So, in or out of copyright. As I said, copyright extends 70 years after the death of the author. 1955, if it's before 1955, the work is no longer in copyright. Photographs taken before 1955 are out of copyright. Government works have been in copyright for 50 years following the date of publication. But if you're using a document published by any Australian government department now, the federal government and nearly all states have said that they have um, committed to Creative Commons licences and even if you've got a published book that was, say, published five years ago when they weren't doing Creative Commons, the deci policy decision applies to material which predates the decision. And a number of um, Australian resources, if you're using Hansard or parliamentary papers, you should quote from them without having to seek permission because of the policy change to Creative Commons. Possibly lots of you aren't using a lot of government publications? Yeah, I am. Ah, OK. Quite a few. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Use this provision. <laughs> so uh, the government's made a decision to make it uh, Creative Commons, so that means you don't have to seek permission and keep administrative records. Well, one of my background papers is just about to be published, and 95% of the sources are government sources, which is parliamentary documents, yep. media releases, reports, and that sort of stuff. That's perfect. <coughs> and as I've said, unpublished work copyright does not expire, but there is a proposed legislation to change that. Oh, absolutely being posed by the Copyright Agency Limited and the Australian Publishers Association. There has um, been a lot of controversy. The Productivity Commission issued a very good report on intellectual, a draft report on intellectual property about a month ago mm -hmm. and the authors have gone quite spare, um, as have Carol. Who's behind the change? So the Productivity Commission, when it commissions reports, have a very, very strong team of economists who look in quite a detailed, analytic way at evidence. And they're um, one of the reasons why the library and wider community um, think it's a great report is it, it talks, it's revitalised again the concept of moving to fair use. So rather than having to rely on all these exceptions and have a whole lot of paperwork about processes that um, reduce the impact of research and add to red tape, they're proposing moving to the fair use model. And one of the statements that was made in the report was that the um, really the financial return on most books published, I think they said is about 15 to 20 years. And so... There's a strong contingent of authors who are saying that's outrageous, I need to have copyright forever because I need to pass down to my family um, future royalties. But in fact, not many authors make significant royalties in Australia. And the ones that do, you know, that's terrific. But it's... Um, you... Oh, I shouldn't say this, but really as a... As a scholarly writer of scholarly works, you're not going to get a lot of revenue. If you write you know, a great, Frank Bongiorno's great book on sex in Australia, people will buy it, and that's terrific, but not many books in Australia sell more than about, that are published in Australia, really sell more than 50 to 100 copies. It's not that they're not great books, it's just a difference of the market. Another question. Oh, um, yes. What I quote most of is political speeches of overseas politicians, where would that fit in the copyright world? Because getting permission might be rather tricky. Might be impossible. Mm. Um, so one of the bizarre things when I was parliamentary librarian was that, um, which I was before I came here um, four and a half years ago, was that you could quote from Ben Shipley, 
Um, you could quote from Deakin, you could quote from all of the early prime ministers, but you couldn't quote from Menzies because that was all in copyright. I mean, you could with permission, but it, it seemed a really silly process given, um, well, how fundamental the Menzies philosophy was to the Labour politicians, the Liberal politicians of the time, and they were quoting him endlessly. Um, but it, it was all still in copyright. So I'll talk, after this, I'll talk about how to get permission and when to draw the line and say enough is enough. Again, it comes down to the substantial, insubstantial, and you may have you know, a dozen different quotes which are all individually insubstantial but help you make the argument so you don't have to do the process. But it, it is bizarre in a way that all of those early um, politicians' um, works are out of copyright and yet others are in. Though if they said it in Parliament, of course, it's all um, Creative Commons now under the government's policy. Well, no, it's also Creative Commons because... I introduced Creative Commons in the Parliament to head for Hansard. So Hansard's have been Creative <coughs> Commons for about eight years now. So Creative Commons is a little bizarre. When we say Creative Commons, it's actually... Yes? Just from an IT perspective, you can just republish some of that stuff so fast on a blog or something like that. How can it possibly remain enforceable as copyright? Um, so the copyright will always exist to protect the expression um, and a lot of people do reproduce material. Some reproduce material um, that is not in copyright. Some people produce mat reproduce material, particularly lots of quotes. And members of parliament want to be quoted everywhere. So they're not going to object um, and not going to require permission. There are regularly <coughs> cases... For more from the larger companies like the Disney if people do put material up um, or aim to republish their material and they will go to significant ends in order to um, so assert their copyright and seek payments. So I assume then it's different to link to something as opposed to actually put yep. it on your site? Yep. There was a case, I'm just trying to think, it was one of the Scottish newspapers... Um, that put a lot of links in and so one of the other newspapers took them to court um, but the, as I understand the end result and there were a number of appeals is that links are perfectly fine because yeah, that's, that's the 90s in the NSN model yep it is so people do all sorts of bizarre things my one other example is that there was some very creative 13 year old boy who wrote to YouTube and, and asserted his ownership of ABC the Australian Broadcasting Commission, and insisted that every um, ABC recording that hadn't been put up by him be taken down. And they did it. <laughs> and then the ABC found out because they'd had all of their recordings that they put up taken down. And um, I heard the head of media, uh, the media section, um, speak shortly after this had happened. And her view, and she did actually get all the ABC stuff restored, was this boy should have been given an A by whatever... Um, law or technology teacher he had in his course because he was so convincing with his arguments. Yes? Um, what about images? Uh, suppose if I take an image, I own the copyright, but what if I take an image of people in a public domain and a public event, could be a sporting event or, or a federal parliament or whatever that might be, could the owner of the event claim copyright for what I have taken image of? So normally what we would say um, is a very clear uh, ownership of copyright would be if you have taken a photo of someone's artwork, that they would have rights over that art. If, they have, if it's still in copyright, they have rights over that artwork, therefore you need to be very careful about reusing that in a published form. If it is a public event and you're taking a photo in a public event, um, I would have thought it would have been fairly hard to assert, for someone else to assert copyright over that. Um, the one thing that uh, at ANU and I put my privacy officer hat on for this is if you are taking photos that you are going to reuse in something that will have very wide distribution and the people are very clearly identifiable and there might be a political overtone or other that's things. That's an ethics that, issue, not a... That's a privacy and ethics issue, that's right. Then you should get permission, but simply taking the photo um, at a public event and um, putting it into your thesis should not be a breach of 
copyright. And if anyone tries to assert that, let me know. Uh, I came across a bit Maya is computer vision and analyze images, uh, and some of them might be from a sporting event, for example. Yes. So, can the owner of the event or assert copyright over the event? Over images that are taken in the public domain, yep. the event is my concern. Probably you would say, or that if if they wanted to prevent photographs being taken of them rent because, you know, for example, they want to stop someone taking a video because they're reselling it on in some other way, they would need to disclose that to you before you attended the event um, rather than afterwards. So I've mentioned Creative Commons a bit. Creative Commons is relatively new. The idea is that it is a computer-generated um, description of rights management which enables um, automatic recognition of limitations. It's a, a, there's a not-for-profit organisation in San Francisco that runs it and the idea is that there are free licences um, with different levels <coughs> of complexity that allow the sharing and reuse of material. One of the complexities is that Australia has some slight differences in its Creative Commons licences to the international ones and I'm just trying to think, are we on edition four or edition five of the Creative Commons licences in Australia so they have changed regularly over time. There are six different licences, there is no test at the end of this presentation but one of the reasons why I wanted to mention them is that they are increasingly used in works that you will be using in your theses, but also when you publish, you may wish to, particularly if you're doing blog posts or if you're publishing in open access journals, you may wish to publish under a Creative Commons licences license. And CC BY is the most uh, open of the licences. Um, and the details are on the website, the previous page has a link to the website. Uh, when you publish under a Creative Commons licence, you still retain the copyright. If anyone who uses your words must cite um, the, your work that it's come from. But there are different ways of restricting the permissions that you're giving. For example, you may be a great photographer or you may be taking a whole lot of images that you wish to use in your context, but you can see there might be some commercial use of, so you might want to say, well, no one else can use it commercially unless I've given them permission for commercial use. So you can retain some rights. Derivative works were quite important for the Parliament, for example, and when Creative Commons was introduced at the Parliament, we, we used a... Um, non-commercial, no derivative works, and, and that doesn't prevent derivative works being made, but says that the approval of the copyright owner needs to be given for them to happen. Different organisations will be more sensitive about reuse than others. It doesn't take away the exceptions to be able to be used for parity, clearly Parliament is used for parity, um, and for news, clearly Parliament's important for news, but you may have things that you wish to retain um, more control over full permissions. And it's quite an important emerging area. We don't have a policy at ANU about using Creative Commons or not. Some universities, the Queensland University of Technology, for example, has a policy that they um, prefer publishing under Creative Commons licences. So now what I'm going to do is give you some top tips. I've talked about the things you don't need to get permission for, things you do need to get permission for, a little bit about Creative Commons. And this is, I'm going to give you my top tips to make life easy. My first top tip is when you find something and you think you're going to, well, when you find something that's going to be really useful to you, particularly if you think you're going to cite from it, write down the reference when you do it. I've had emails from on Saturday in fact, from someone doing their final rewrite of their thesis, saying, I've got this quote and I don't know who, <laughs> who said this, and I don't know if it was in a journal article or a book chat, but that's, we've all had those moments. I've had those moments 
So using Mendeley's or Tiro and EndNote are really helpful ways of tracking things down. If you're using Mendeley, it will automatically put a copy of the journal article into your library, um, as well as the citation, which makes it quite easy. And all of these, um, we have training packages from uh, in the ILP library in the, in the library, and we've also got online guides. Um, it's very helpful. But there will be one or two that you will come to the end and you will go, I just can't remember. And we can help you find those things too, we hope. I did find the one that I was being looking for. The second tip is ask for permission early. So if you think you're going to use something that is substantial and it is in copyright... You can do a little spreadsheet, and we are going to produce a little booklet, an online booklet, so you can just use the spreadsheet where you've got the citation, who you asked for permission, when you asked, and if you couldn't find the author, you record that you did that. So you, you only have to do this once. And it's quite handy to be able to record that. Most of the major publishers, and I think this is a good principle, will say that if you are seeking permission to use something and it is substantial... <laughs> and you've tracked them down and got an email address. You know, three is the maximum number of times you need to ask email someone. So if you email them, give them a couple of weeks, send them another email, give them another couple of weeks, send them a final email, that's plenty. If you if they don't respond during that period of time, you've done your very best. Trade publishing is up to sort of six weeks for your first inquiry. They don't put it on the top of the list. So again, it's tracking down who is the actual copyright owner. So sometimes, and this is some of the complexity, sometimes the copyright owner will be the author, and I generally start with the author because <coughs> you don't know what's in the contract they've signed with the publisher, and you also don't know what close clauses they've struck out in their publisher agreement. So I usually start with the author because you'll often find that they've also used phrases more than once, so you can, might find a work that's better to use in that way. Because like you, I don't find publishers very responsive to this sort of inquiry. What about something that someone has said at a public function many years ago, and I approach that person and <coughs> take them for a bit notes and ask for permission at the time if I could use it. Um, and I know I've used that quote in my thesis as part of my subtitle. Do I need to go back to that person now, even though I've got that permission no, I would just write up if you've got, if you've got permission for um, even verbal permission to use an expression, then I would just put it in the spreadsheet. And this just covers covers you really at the end. <coughs> That's fine. And you might even find you don't need to have a spreadsheet. You just put everything in the folder. Um, and that's fine, you just need to be able to make sure you've got that, particularly for journal articles or monographs that you might publish after you finish your thesis or during your thesis, because every publisher you submit to will say that you, you are attesting to them that you have permissions for third-party material that you are using. Any other comments or thoughts here? Right, yep. Question for National Libraries of Trove. Yes. I would guess that material would be out of copyright and free snow or is it? So the, all of the newspapers that have been digitised on Trove are out of copyright. There are a couple of collections that have been digitised that are still in copyright. The Australian Women's Weekly is one example of those. So again, look at the year. Look at whether it's a substantial quote or not. So see whether you need to do the work. Um, images are often more worth the work <coughs> than um, short bits of text. Um, but most of Trove will be out of copyright, but not necessarily everything. And if this also comes to that question, is everything that is available online or on the internet out of copyright or able to be used without having to seek permission? And <coughs> I must say, some sites, when you look at it, not including the library um, subscribed uh, journals, um, and I sometimes look at 
blogs and look at them and look at the about pages and all sorts of things and I'm clueless as to whether it's possible to use it or not. So sometimes you just have to pursue and ask the author um, and it's a bit frustrating to have to do that. You think they published it online, surely they want to share it with everyone um, but sometimes covering yourself by asking the question can be really useful. Yep. Um, going back to images again, if you Google, you, you can limit Google search for images to yep. um, uh, permission to reuse um, images for non-commercial use, for example. Yep. Is that, would you say that that's sufficient? If Absolutely. So this is again, top, my top tip for images. Uh, Google and Flickr have um, a search that you can do with usage rights um, and you can have no name copyright restrictions or um, free to use, use and share. And I, I absolutely take that as doesn't require permission for use in your thesis um, or in other publications. Would you re record those images as, because the label could change in the future, how what would, you, how do, would you manage that? That's a really interesting question. So, and yes, and again, it would depend. Um, and I think if someone, um, who, if you were using hundreds of images, say, to do a whole lot of pattern recognition and things like that, and you were doing scraping, you might want to record that for the collection set. Uh, you use some form of setting, particularly if you're doing automatic harvesting. Um, but I wouldn't record it for every single image because that would seem a lot of work. If you're doing deep analysis, say, on a particular painter or a creative artist, so you're using um, a defined set of images um, that may or may not prove to still be in copyright but have you know, a small number demonstrating particular things that are significant you might want to record them individually, but I tend to try and record them as a group as far as possible, just to minimise the paperwork. It's really, these are really handy. So this is where I, I got Flickr and um, Google Images for this, from using that. For your thesis, thinking about your thesis, particularly at this stage, are there any other questions or comments or considerations that you want to talk about? Yep. Um, I wasn't sure how drafts, like drafts from other individuals, like are incorporated when you know, like cite those types of things. Could you go into a little bit of detail on how copyright is covered for draft papers, like for example on academia.edu or something like that? Yep. If it's written, copyright exists in it, whether it's published or not. Whether it's published or not is, um, in Australia, affects the term of copyright, not whether copyright exists or not. Um, one of the things, particularly in economics, um, is you will find draft papers published as working papers. Um, it's a regular practice. And then the final paper will come out in a journal, but there'll be a working paper that is a draft. So if you're using a working paper and it hasn't yet been published, always cite the working paper. Um, or, or you may choose to wait till it's published and then cite it in the published version. As soon as it's written, copyright is invested in the document, the email, the blog post, um, and it might be a draft. Uh, if it's something that has been sent to you by another individual, you will often cite that as an unpublished work, an unpublished, or you might cite it as an email, um, and you can quote from that. Again, the substantial, insubstantial issue applies, um, and it's probably, if they send it to you in an email, if you want to quote a significant part of it, it's probably easy to contact them because you've got their contact details. But it doesn't have to be published to have copyright, it's your use of it um, that relates to what permissions you need. But if it's written, it's written. And I was going to say, if you go away and think about it, examples as well, don't hesitate to email Imogen or me because we want to run further, further um, sessions and they might be a bit you know, shorter or focused on different issues. So if you go away and think about 
examples or questions that you haven't had time to ask today, um, we're quite happy to run focus sessions on that. Yep. Just wondering, no, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this, <coughs> but from my point of view, doing a thesis by publication and in the biomedical sphere, are there particular publishers you would recommend not dealing with because of potential issues? Um, ah, I've actually got a little set thing on predatory pricing publishing at the end of this. Mm. Thank you for coming. Um, you would choose a, a, a journal, let's say, select a journal based on the subject, yeah. the people who read it. And I've got to say, I publish in library science and I submitted an article to the Australian Library Journal, which is a Taylor and Francis publication, which has, from my perspective, one of the most dreadful author agreements and I published one article, substantial article this year and a book review last year and I signed it in both cases and I thought I can't believe I'm signing this. But it was you know, relatively harmless and it meant that my work was published in a way that will communicate to the audience I wanted to communicate with. So you have to make pragmatic decisions. So at the end of the day I guess I'm wanting to be able to reproduce in the final digital thesis or otherwise, the publisher's version yep. of the article would apply. So some publishers have embargo periods. Nature has now developed what they call an enhanced service. So Nature, um, which you used, used to, and still can, um, pay an article processing fee so that you can have the article in your local repository is now saying, no, you can just have the citation because we're going to offer you this enhanced service so we keep control of your journal article for life. So it, it's a tricky environment. Publishers are offering a range of different models and while some of my colleagues would have particular views on some publishers, when I look at practices across the whole sector, it's not great. There was a study done of the um, publications for which article processing fees was were paid in the UK. I think it was the Wellcome Trust um, uh, funded research and over a quarter of the articles that were published by Wiley, who's a very good publisher, for which article processing fees had been paid to make them open access weren't made available open access. Um, so it's no, I guess, it's a very complex area. Probably not a lot of help, but... Yes, please. I've had a few interesting experiences through um, CAL. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I've been a member of CAL for a long time, and for many years I actually received payments for quite a bit of my work. Um, one of them was from a, for a letter to the editor of the journal that I co authored with a colleague. Ah. And apparently which had been made mandatory reading by a couple of universities. Um, so I just got a payment with you, which I could share with my co author Yep. Um, that went on for a long time until obviously got taken off the reading list. Um, they don't make any credit money out of that um, inadvertently. There was another one where I had a book chapter published by Cambridge University Press, and apparently the agreement I'd signed was that I would get 50% of the royalties um, from, from the proceeds of the, my chapter, so to speak. Yep. Um, and Cal accidentally were paid me the form out, and Cambridge um, pursued me after that um, oh. through a court action. And I just went back to, I got the lawyers to write to Cal and said, well, you made a mistake, you know. So I mean, eventually yeah. you have to pay half of it back. But only half of it, not the whole lot, because Cambridge wanted the whole lot. But the agreement that I'd signed was for 50%. And then I was negotiating um, the authorship of another book chapter for another book. And I withheld my permission for ages because the, I was signing away my rights, as you say, and I had this yeah. experience of getting some money. And I thought, I'm going to put my foot down here and insist on this. Eventually, I had to cave in. It was another publisher, but uh, and I gave away the, the rights, of course, the price of the rights. Yep. I still own the copyright to the material, but I don't get any money out of it anymore. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that whole financial side is quite complex. If you publish a book, and if it's purchased by a public library in Australia, you get a public lending right payment. Um, and if it's in school libraries, you'll get educational right payments. So it's quite a complex rights issue. Um, <coughs> The thing I would say in terms of publishers and the ability to have it available open, the journal article available in an open access form quickly is we have the ANU expert sitting at the back of the room. <laughs> 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 and, 
Anne LaHaye is the manager of um, our open research unit at the uh, university library and runs the repository and she can search different places to find out about conditions and she's very helpful. Get in touch. Do you have some money for page charges? And <laughs> No, I should say one of the other issues that I talk regularly to the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research about is that <coughs> my personal view is we should have a fund, particularly for early career researchers and PhD students, so they could apply for APC funds. Doing it by publication, you're actually under pressure to try and get stuff published. Yep. Really in a quite a <coughs> period of time, and journals can take a Years. very long time to respond to you before you even know that you're possibly going to and then you know, six months later they decide no. Um, you invest a lot of time in that. You do. You go, and you can't you go to the next one. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're on hold until they um, accept the lesson on yours. Yes. Do you think this digital world, we get a chance to self publish? So some of our thesis components <coughs> can go as like PDF docs or, you know, for me, I'm uh, doing uh, interdisciplinary between the arts and the sciences. Just looking at, at photography, but photography with uh, kind of a how-to component to that. So if you, if you self-publish, if you release it as a PDF, for example, does it still gain the same amount of protection and um, as if we were publishing it in a journal or something else? So I might take the answer in two different ways. The first is if you write something, copyright applies and protects you. Um, you don't actually have to have it published in order for that protection to accrue. If you want to publish your PhD by publication, then it has to be published in books, journal articles, conference papers, and there's quite a lot of university rules around that process. So self-publishing your um, PDFs, as, my, as I understand it, but you, you should seek advice from, the, um, uh, from within your school or within your college, uh, would not, my understanding is, currently meet the requirements for a thesis by publication. Oh, no, not that you do yep. a thesis by publication, but I'm talking about, so right now we're talking about protection in terms of uh, and our ability as students to access the material. Yep. But once we've compiled our, our ideas and our material, uh, protecting ourselves, uh, our own information as we release it. Yep. Um, and this I was wondering because part of the thesis process that I'm using is is compiling some of the information, making it into e-docs, and then give it up to community so that that's part of the research process is getting that feedback. Ah, yes. And then that becomes part of the, the, the research evolution in some yep. sense. So when you release those documents, do you still have the protection uh, in terms of the, phot the photographs that go with it and the ideas that go with it? You have protection in terms of the expression. So photographs, text, if you do tables or if you do maps of where the images are as well, that is all protected when you release the PDF to anyone else. All protected. And you don't have to use the C, and you don't have to date it. One of the things about releasing it in that way is you will actually have embedded metadata in the document. Right. Should anyone else um, use it later on, you'll be able to prove that it was actually released at that time. And I'm not saying published, released, therefore you had ownership of those ideas. Always good to make sure your name is there in the metadata as well. Yeah, the catch is that metadata can be can be erased rather easily, from, especially from photographs. It can be, but if you put it on um, a website or into some place uh, which archives material, then that provides further evidence because there's that archival copy. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so journal articles and conference papers. If you include copyright material in your thesis and the copyright does not belong to you, and it's substantial, again the word is substantial, you must either seek permission to include the material or omit it from the open access version of your thesis. This is taken from the, the form that you will sign when it's published. Um, so, 
Anne again is manager of the repository where your open access conference papers, journal articles will, will appear, hopefully. But in terms of journal articles and conference papers, again, keeping track of substantial um, uh, uh, per permissions that you have to use substantial uh, material in your um, publication, um, conference paper, often called grey literature, um, is, is just as important as in your thesis and you apply the same sort of requirements. And again, the same sort of exceptions if it's material that's owned by the university, if it's material that's creative commons, if the copyright is expired, you don't need to get permissions. Same principles. So what's free to use and what's not? Um, as we discussed, not everything that is available on the internet is free to use without permission. Um, images are a particularly complex area and these are just great places to go to uh, acquire material, whether you want to use a large co corpus of knowledge or whether you want to use just some illustrative images. But it's absolutely helpful. Now... This is probably impossible to read, but it will, you will all get a copy of the slides. So what I've done is a draft email here, um, which you should feel free to put, do whatever you want with. But um, certainly, I, as ANU Copyright Officer, I regularly get requests for use of ANU material from um, publishers, so I've taken account of those sort of standards. It's always helpful to introduce yourself so that the person you're seeking permission from knows who you are and um, you will get a lot of support um, as a PhD student, uh, as an early career academic from other academics to use materials. I'm writing to ask you for your permission to use whatever it is that you want to use um, in your thesis or journal article. I'm keen to have your permission. It's always nice to butter them up as your material is very important to my analysis. I, will, um, I encourage you always to ask for this. Um, don't you, so if you want to use it in your thesis or in your journal article, but you think you will probably continue to write in this subject area, you might want to cover off the potential to use the material in future articles. Most people will say yes to that. And once you've got that permission, you, know, you are very likely after you've done your thesis to continue to write journal articles or monographs. And if you can get it, um, try very hard. Could you please advise me by such and such a date with advice about the permission request? Now, generally speaking, this second sentence I don't use in the first email. But if you write, give them a couple of weeks, you get no response. Right, you know, you can send the same thing again and still get no response. And I always think it's useful to say this, you know, like final letter of demand. If I do not hear from you by this time, I will take that as approval for use of the image and be quite explicit um, because your valuable time is being used in this. You're trying very hard, um, using the best contact that you've been able to find. And again, library staff will try and help you... Um, and a Google Scholar and someone else mentioned ResearchGate before and academia.au can often be very good ways to stalk an academic that you would stalk... No, <coughs> no case an academic that you wish to use. Um, but I think that can be quite a, a useful um, final point after you've written once or twice and I'd like nicely to say, well, you know, if you don't have the courtesy or the time to get back to me because you don't think it's a problem and you might be a fair use nation so you're not used to people asking for this sort of thing, say, look, I'm just going to take it as permission to do that. So, any other comments or examples before I give two minutes on predatory publishers? Now, I don't know if any of you have been... We run a short course on predatory publishers, but one of the things that has emerged are publishers, and this is an early cartoon from Puck that was uh, a revolution um, about pirate publishers, and at this stage, if you published a book in a country, and 
I've got to say, the early copyright, I've heard some eminent experts talk about this, was really about printers controlling who could print it rather than authors controlling rights. So the printers could print a book in a nation and then another nation, any printer could then print it um, and pay no remuneration to the original printer. So that's what this cartoon is all about. Um, but in these days of uh, a proliferation of journals, confusion with open access, um, opportunistic people seeking to create revenue through article processing fees, you will probably get in your mailbox reasonably regularly invitations to speak at journals that you've never heard of, um, which are of dubious quality and will do nothing for your professional reputation. I get asked to write, re write regularly for the International Journal of Agriculture. <laughs> I have no idea why I have no background in that. Um, so the reason I put up this slide was just to say Publishing and rights is a complex area. Predatory publishers have made it more complex. We can provide you with advice from the library um, and we run regular information sessions. And again, Anne is incredibly knowledgeable and helpful in this area. And sometimes you have to be very diligent when you look at a journal to identify that it is in fact not from a quality publisher that will add to your reputation. Um, and this in that Facebook post where you appear on ask for publications and do not contact me and do not contact me and the whole thing in an abstract and they published it. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a, a one too and it's, uh, now is it, um, get me off your effing, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right and it was accepted <laughs> and it was said to be highly relevant and it's got no other words in it than that, the whole article. <laughs> but they wanted an article processing fee so they got it so just be careful about that. So probably, I thought, not so much for this audience, but um, we've got a little um, web document up to help you with using material for teaching. And again, probably the biggest tip for teaching is if you want to use images, go to the um, uh, no commercial restriction um, sections in uh, advanced Google's image searching and Flickr. Um, and there are, again, exception-based, but... Um, if you are using, um, if you wish to use chapters and journals that you need digitised that are not available in digital form from the library, come and see us because we've got a way of making those available to use in teaching. What, yep. what rights do you have to material that you produce while you work for one university when you move to another university, for example? Do you have the right to reuse it? You produced it? Because yep. the employer owns all your rights and, you know, and your It's a very good question. So I can only speak for ANU. I mean, there have been a number of court cases. I think the most recent ones were related to the University of Melbourne. But the ANU intellectual property um, policy says if you as a, a lecturer or tutor um, write material that you're using in the teaching, the copyright of that material rests with you but you give, a, because you're doing it as an employee of ANU, you give ANU a licence to use it. So it is your work, but we have a licence to use it, So, which means that if you go on to another institution, it may be that the next tutor or lecturer amends the work and takes it on, but cannot sell it for profit. It's yours. Um, and um, cannot um, traduce your moral rights in any way. Yeah, so they have to assign uh, author rights to the original person who produced it. So, you so even someone else yep. is modifying my lecture notes in, in the future, they still have to assign the, to, to recognise my authorship over the material, for example. Absolutely. And where the distinction between teaching material and research, because ultimately can a university use your research material and say, we have a licence to use it? So that is specifically about teaching material within the intellectual property um, process. In terms of the research materials, there are probably some different approaches for lab notes, say, to programs that you've developed, to anything that you wish to uh, make into um, a, a venture for sale, and publications. So that's probably a level of detail that I'd be happy to have a conversation with you and a, and a coffee on, but you will always retain the 
um, intellectual property. I think that's it. Yes. When I first came to this um, seminar, I thought copyright is different from copyright. Uh, because that was more like the editing and the formatting and yep. fonting and so forth. Is that a difference or is that not? Or? So we put the W in copyright for a bit of fun because it's about writing. Um, but if you are publishing, uh, let's say, a book and you are using particular typesetting and particular styles, the typesetters will retain. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I do have copyright over that. And in the past, what sort of cases have been enforced in terms of copyright, and especially in the academic process? And you know, have research, researchers been sued personally, and PhD students been sued in terms of? In my mind. Thank you for coming. In my mind, unless it's financial gain, that, and also if there's the, the defamation, there's no point suing someone because you're not going to get anything from it, especially under Australian law. But in your, in your you. experience, do you know any, any cases in the past that, you know, especially from general public, you know, publishers you. especially? So publishers tend to be more vigilant about this rather than um, scholarly authors, because scholarly authors mostly want their, their ideas, the expression of their ideas, to stimulate other ideas and to contribute to uh, greater scholarship. And that's what the whole scholarly communication system is about. Any that has any Some that publishers, um, uh, especially going up to the like Elsevier, will write and ask for things to be taken down. Um, if they find that you are reproducing significant parts of their work in your thesis or publication, you would expect either we would receive something and would receive something in terms of managing the response to th that. Okay. So or the university will protect you in some level in terms of the legal process because it'll take hours and yep. you know, a lot of money to protect yourself as a direct straight at you versus the institution. So the main thing we would say is make sure you cover off all of your third party permissions for significant material. That's one of the reasons why we're trying to run these sort of um, interactive workshops and to talk to people because if you've done all of that then, then the can't be any problem afterwards, or if you need to rely on an exception. But you haven't had any personal experience with legal cases? We, we've had threats um, yeah, in no, terms of ANU. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of them, but I certainly am aware of um, copying cases where, um, well, the first big copying case was against the University of New South Wales where a student copied a whole book, um, and that led to... Uh, a whole lot of other actions in relation to copyright enforcement and CAL. Um, but I get this tied down a little bit more when I think of a very basic but still a very important concept the open access version of the thesis. Yes. So, at what point in the cycle did this typically come? And the exact forms of notes, for example, the deposit of the university in library, is that open access? So, if you signed up, Thank you everyone for coming um, and were accepted as a PhD student after the 1st of January 2011. I'm just looking at Anne in case I get the date wrong. She's saying yes, I got it right. Sometimes I don't. Um, but, oh, then you're required to submit a digital thesis. When you submit your digital thesis, I mean, you, you, if you wish a restriction to be applied to it, whether it's a 12 month, month embargo whether it's a, a permanent embargo or full or part of that, um, you need to write a case, and that will go to the Pro Vice Chancellor of Research and Research Training, who will make a decision. And in some ways, it's exactly the same process that we had in print. Uh, so when people submitted print theses, if you go and look at our 1950s theses, you will see that some have restricted parts. Yeah. And sometimes the whole thesis is restricted. Sometimes that's because of um, indigenous sensitivities. Sometimes it's because um, of, you know, gender-based sensitivities or other uh, other particular um, issues. Sometimes in this day and age, a thesis might there might be an application for it not to be made open access. <coughs> the patent is pending, but the process is digital submission 
um, any desire for um, restrictions for open access needs to be made and it won't be made open access until the PVC has made a decision about whether uh, a restriction will be applied or not. So she, she makes decisions about the application of restrictions, um, not about open access per se, it's just the cases where there's a desire to restrict access. Right, okay, so I'm a pre-111. Yep. And so on. Uh, but I still see quite a few theses from those antique days on the side in the library, departmental libraries, the main libraries, and so on. So I presume all of these principles would apply equally to those. Well, anyone who wants a restriction on a thesis um, needs to put that, um, and it used to be just on the paper form for the paper theses. Um, we are retrospectively digitising theses. Um, we're doing that on, um, se under Section 200AB of the Copyright Act and we've done most of the 1950s theses. Okay. Uh, if they had no restrictions, so the intention was to contribute to scholarly communication, um, we're digitising them so that they can contribute to scholarly communication. Wow. And it's really interesting the number of women who did theses in the 1950s and the diversity of the research. Right, wow. okay. Well, that's the famous one across the Australian legend. Yep. <laughs> yes. My question would be in what circumstances do we have to write an email to them and ask for permission? Like, do I need to write that for every article I cite in my manuscript? Or so, again, it comes to substantial. So, if you're using you know, a, a number of paragraphs from two or three particular authors and their articles in order to uh, establish your theories or your methodology. In those cases, you are using a substantial portion. Thank you so much. Therefore, you need to write and get permission. If you're using a, you know, a couple of lines from five different people and, and each individually is not substantial, then you do, don't need to get permissions for those five individual quotes. So for it, then we, if I'm using like a few sentences from their journal article, no, not if it's just an insubstantial portion. Okay. By substantial, it's like the whole paragraph? Yeah, or a significant part of the argument. So it needs to be um, from someone who hasn't been dead for 70 years, it needs to be from, from um, not a university publication, not a Creative Commons publication, um, not from a journal database that we're delivering to you in the library. Oh, okay. Those ones you will need to so write and get permission for. Fine in the super search category, I don't need to Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. You can check with your local library, but pretty much all of those we uh, the contracts cover that you'll use. Um, another thing is based on a research point of view. So if I'm so if I'm duplicating someone else's work, but it's not in the same way, do I need to send an email saying to them that I'm um, actually test what whatever you've done in your no, because what you're doing is you're using their idea and taking it to the next stage. It's when you're actually using and quoting substantial sections of their text that you need permission. So this 200 words is a pretty good rule. Of it's pretty... It's, it's, I mean, in books we talk about 10%, you know, talk 10% mm -hmm. of the journal or a, or a chapter. Mm -hmm. You know, 200, if it's under 200, it's not going to be very long, is it? No, absolutely not. No. So that's good. My preoccupation is political speech. Is so <gasps> wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that all, they're speeches from people in the region, not, not Australian uh, speeches. So. All right. I just keep on to <laughs> <laughs> uh, Because they'd love to be quoted. Thank you, Thank you for coming.